Riley from the Muskegon Channel, and today I have the pleasure and honor of welcoming Kit Cummings, who is coming to Muskegon through the uh, efforts of some really incredible people who do what they can to uh, make some positive change here in uh, Muskegon. Kit, um, uh, Char Bortman is the one who uh, approached Kit first. First of all, Kit, thank you for taking a couple of minutes to advance your uh, visit here to Muskegon, and uh, thanks for taking a few minutes to uh, come talk to some people around town about your work. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, Char is a great friend, and I've uh, developed some great relationships with Muskegon. Been there many times now, so I'm excited to come back. Well, well see, that's I got to pay better attention because I I thought maybe this was your first visit, and uh, you're, you're you're coming and you're bringing a message, and we're going to get to that in a second. But uh, as we've talked on the phone, getting leading up to the interview and all that kind of stuff. You know, the message comes after some life experience. I, I don't think guys with a message exactly uh, get that way without finding their way, you know, through a couple of bumps in the road. <laughs> Tell me about Kit Cummings and, and how you got where you are. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I grew up here in Atlanta. I've been here all my life. I uh, get to travel a pretty good bit. Um, grew up kind of the least likely guy to go in the ministry. And I mean that, not just from my <laughs> perspective, but everybody who know me, <laughs> not kind of like where I was headed, but had a, uh, you know, so I found some trouble growing up, but, um, you know, sports kept me out of too big of trouble. And, uh, but anyway, went and played a little in, in college, ended up at University of Georgia and took a minute to get out of there and then uh, got out and got into the entertainment business for a couple really? of years. Really? what you do? And, uh, I was a record promotion back really? in the day. Because I did radio was, for years and years and years. And I'm going to, uh, were you there in the heyday when it was really fun? I mean, when. Well, right after that. So after the big uh, story broke in Chicago that tore the whole thing up. Yeah, it was right after that. So no, crazy. Well, you missed some good times, man. We, uh, we really had a good time uh, back in the uh, day. <laughs> we'll leave that to your uh, your viewers' <laughs> imagination. <laughs> but we'll, the we'll book's talk coming offline. out at some point. Don't worry. We'll, we'll talk all about that. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But anyway, um, you know, had a pretty uh, dramatic transformational experience. Let's put it that way at 25. Right. And, you know, I do everything one speed. It's all out. And that could be good or bad. So back right. in the day, it was kind of crazy. And, you know, when I when I went through that change, I went through that the same way. And I decided I had to tell the whole world. Sure. So I went to the ministry and uh, surprised everybody who knew me and, and took about three years before I was ordained. And then I went and started um, leading churches. By the time I was in my early 30s, I was in charge of a few thousand people, which was probably way too fast. But, you know, it is what it is. And so by after 15 years in the uh, full time ministry, planting, leading, taking over churches, um, I just burn out and resigned, walked away from a couple thousand people, uh, wasn't fired, wasn't let go. They tried to get me to stay and I just didn't have any gas in the tank. And so I went through that, that next couple of years was, uh, kind of a, my wilderness experience. Sure. And then, uh, uh, met my, my wife after, um, I went through a divorce yep. and, you know, went through kind of a public, uh, somewhat a fall from grace and had to, to work my way up out of that and kind of earn my way back. And, uh, and I did, and I got remarried in 06. Uh, we have, you know, four beautiful kids together, but I started my own business in 08 because I was out there hustling, you know, doing whatever I had to do. Um, did a little real estate, a little banking, little insurance, whatever I could do, um, for about five years, uh, almost five years. And then, but I, you know, kind of had drifted away from my gift and I lost my dream. And so I went back and I started my own business uh, doing speaking and uh, did okay. But uh, everything changed in 2009 when I walked into a prison to serve and something happened there that caught hold of me. And for the last decade, I've been traveling, doing prison schools and churches around the country and even overseas and developing, you know, this peace initiative that we're bringing to Muskegon. I've got a little experience in that, in that neighborhood. Um, I, I've gone through that, that same change that you have. I don't know what sparked yours, but for me, it was alcoholism and Mine too. I, yeah, same thing. Yep. yep. So, okay. Yep. So, you know, and I, I, I was very fortunate that in my sobriety experience, um, you know, I started when I was 12, by the time I was Me 33, too. 
it was a couple gallons of whiskey a week and you know i needed to be medically detoxed i had i had the night i deserved detoxing it was everything you would expect and then night two it was it was literally the saul to paul story um you know when mm. you are hit by that bolt of lightning and everything changes and 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 from there you you just it's a paradigm shift in your entire life. So I, I get where you're coming from. And, and I've, I've kind of tried to follow in your footsteps a little bit. And, and as, as much as I haven't been into a prison yet, I, I do what I can at our county jail here. And, you know, tonight, Tuesday night is reading night. I get down there and um, I, I reading tutor uh, to guys that can already read, but it ain't about reading anyway, in my mind, you know, I, I kind of want to stop that recidivism and, if if I'm gathering the thought, and you're probably thinking like I do too, um, jails and prisons, I don't think they work. And I'm guessing that recidivism is a big part of what you're trying to get these guys to turn into and, and get away from as well. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's out of control. I mean, there's there's states where it's as high as two-thirds mm. of uh, those that are released, reoffend, or get revoked within three years. Um, it's a repeat customer model. Yep. Um, now the privatization of prisons is a horrible thing as, like as you know, companies are incented to keep the beds filled. And that means we're not just locking up people. We are, you know, sending more customers and they're getting out, coming back. And, you know, the prison population from eight, uh, 1980 to now has gone from about 500,000 to almost two and a half million. OK, mm. and we're building more prisons than schools. So, no, I totally agree. And and I love how open you are about your life. I wish, you know, for those that can, um, I think we need to take the, the shame and stigma away from addiction and recovery. And, you know, some of the things that we're dealing with in these kids, because a lot of the, the people in prison are poor. You know, it's filled. State prisons are filled with poor people, white, black yeah. and brown, um, especially, you know, people of color. And um, yeah, that drives me. Uh, big time to want to change things. And so, um, you know, and that led to me with this prevention program, trying to keep kids out. Yeah. Um, but, you know, shoot, I just love when I'm in Muskegon, I get to go see some of my friends over there at uh, Brooks Correctional. And, um, you know, I've seen them many times and I, I just uh, keep coming back to see them because they do as much for me as I do for them. I'll tell you that. You get that in, in, in the jail setting and, it, and it's, it's hard for people to grasp until they actually take that step through those doors. And what, you know, when you're hearing the doors clink behind you, it ain't the most comfortable feeling in the entire world, you know? And I, I mean, my entire drinking career, I mean, from 12 to 33, I got one night in jail out of it. And I got pretty fortunate in the fact that it was only one night in the, in the, in the, in the drunk tank when it literally could have been me in any one of these guys shoes for 20 to 25, 30 years, because I could have killed somebody in my, in my drunken stupor. Uh, and I should have, I should have either killed yeah. myself. I should have caused an accident. I should have, there's a million things that, that should have gone wrong that didn't. And I don't know why. And, and I know that on the other end of it, the sobriety type thing to keep it, you got to give it away. Yes, and exactly. of these guys that I've met in the County jail on my Tuesday nights, I have yet to meet a true criminal. Uh, I, I, I meet addicts whose life circumstances put them in this situation. And that could have been me. And no, that that's what's important to me about going back and trying to get that hand out and, and, and saying, Hey, there's a better life on the other side. What can I do to help you? And absolutely. you take that message a little further. Tell me about the message you bring when you speak to these groups. Okay. So um, I didn't know that the first prison that I got connected to in Georgia was happened to be Georgia's most violent and dangerous maximum mm. period prison with more Trial active by fire. <laughs> Welcome to the club. <laughs> uh, more active gang, gang members. Uh, so it was a place where you just send guys that they couldn't really control any other way. So sure. very dangerous place. But I didn't know. I did just a prison, my first prison. I thought all of them were like that. But um, I went in there doing a Bible study and, you know, five guys showed up and then 10 and four. We were filling the cafeteria and then they moved it to general population. Let me start going in the dorms, which was unheard of for volunteers at that time. But I had developed, um, you know, respect and a following there at Hayes, uh, 1,200 men. And we started having open call outs and uh, the warden allowed me to work with some of the heavy guys in some of the gangs. And uh, we got together a little round table um, leadership group. And then we started 
getting them to invite, you know, their guys. And before we knew it, we had, you know, crowds of rival gangs in the same room starting to work together and peace came to that prison for a magical season. And, um, the, it, it won institution of the year that year in the state of Georgia, which wow. was a worst to first kind of a deal. And those men did it, but you know, I got the credit and actually that's how I got to Muskegon for the first time. I was, I was going around speaking, I was doing prison tours and warden Mary Burgess from Brooks. Um, she and I just happened to be speaking at the same conference. We saw each other and, she came up after my message and said, would you come to, to Muskegon and run your program in the prisons there? And I said, absolutely. And that started, you know, a several year run where at Brooks under Miss Mary's leadership, um, there was a 50 percent decline in violence. Wow. Um, and as we ran literally about a thousand fifteen hundred inmates through the program and um, saw significant changes. So. Shoot, I owe a lot to Muskegon. So I want uh, y'all to know, uh, you know, I, I come there when I'm invited because y'all changed my life. Sure. Town of Miracles, man. It really is. I, uh, so I, I came here with an alcohol problem and a couch, right, for a radio job. And when I quit, I kind of figured that the town was going to look at me and go, ah, up yours, you're the next one that quits. And who wants you around? <laughs> it, it was nothing but. Thank you for what you did, Andy. Go chase your dream in NASCAR and, and, you know, go do what you did. You did everything you could here. They loved me before I knew how to love myself. And that's right. that's my debt to this community and why I do what I do. So yeah. it's a great thing. Yeah. So you, you come, you speak at the, the jail. You're, you do have an open opportunity for people to come and hear your message at the New Life Christian Center on October 14th at 10. Tell me a little bit about when you go to a church like that. What, how, what What's your message to the group there? Yeah, great question. Well, um, you know, when I was doing these prisons all around, typically schools around the prisons and churches, uh, a lot of times around the prisons would invite me when I came to town. Sure. Um, the message in the schools captivated the, the young people because it had a gangster element, you know, and a lot of their, their culture and media and hip hop music and movies and gaming is their culture. And so that got their attention and held it. When I went into the churches, um, you know, Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats, you know, when Jesus said, uh, when I was hungry, thirsty, naked, a stranger, sick and in prison, you came to, to visit me. And they said, you know, you weren't ever any of those things. And he said, whatever you do for the least of these, you yeah. do for me. Yeah. And I, I started thinking about it. And the convict is the only, you know, kind of part of that equation that is all six. They're yeah. hungry. They're thirsty, they're naked, they don't have their own clothes, you know, they're sick, a lot of a lot of mental health issues, they're addicted, you know, they're strangers, and they're in prison. And, you know, they've been demonized. But yet, if I asked, you know, all your viewers, listeners right now, raise your hand if you know somebody that's been in the system, almost every hand would go up. These aren't all evil people. And so I found that my faith was just put on steroids when I went in there because he made a promise. He said, um, whenever you serve the least of these, I am there. And I took that literal. So I started going behind the razor wire and looking for God in all these people inside. And I think that was kind of, you know, what, what set me apart to them is I wasn't trying to bring God to them. I was trying to find God in them. And so I started telling the story to churches and they came alive, you know, because and I didn't say, you know, I said, few of y'all probably need to go behind the razor wire. That's a that's a calling. However, if you go, it'll change your life. But there's a lot of the least of these in this community. And he didn't say, you know, for super Christians, you know, go and serve some people. But the rest right. of you just give your money, you know, show up when you want. He said, no, he said sheep and goats for those that serve the least of these. Those are sheep. For those that didn't care about the least of these, those are goats. And, um, you know, God will sift them out. And so I didn't do it out of fear. I did it out of love. And, and I've been going because I made a promise to them a long time ago. I'm going to take your message to the world. And I meant it because those men changed my life. And so the more that I spread it, kind of like you were talking about, the more that you go and serve these brothers in the jail that have addiction issues, you're the one that gets the most and uh, that this service ministry keeps me clean and sober. You know, yeah. it's been you know, what, 13 years, I guess. Yeah. And for me, 
Dude, that's a big damn deal. Well, excuse me, that's a big deal. <laughs> Dude, I didn't think I'd be alive still, to be honest with you. Here, here I am 15 years without a drop, and it's like, whoa, how'd this happen, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, man, I'm not thirsty today. Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't get me wrong, man. On a good hot day, that the sound of a beer still sounds pretty good, but, you know, you just avoid that first one, and the rest of the train ain't going to hit you, so yeah. that's a pretty good I thing. Tell guys, I tell guys they're trying to get clean or sober, I'm like, look – if you will hang with this, you'll yep. develop a life that you love so much you wouldn't trade it for a drink. Yep. And so it, that shift happened where I love my life. And so that little temptation is pretty small as opposed yep. to back in the day when I was white knuckling saying, go, oh, wish I could drink, wish I was like normal people. Now I'm like, no, I'm, I'm glad that he made me like this, you know? Yeah, I'm with you. So you do Brooks in the evening after the church there on the 14th. You're back to Brooks. That's a good thing. October 15th, you're actually going to go to my wife's school, if I'm not mistaken, out there in Fruitport, and you're going to speak to some kids out there. Your message to the schools. Okay. What do you talk to school kids about? Oh, man. Um, the, the latest program that we've rolled out in schools that is really starting to get some traction and demand. Um, I'm, I'm, I was loaded with eight schools this summer, doing eight this fall. I'm starting to put you know schools off into the spring to do the next one. They're eight-week character and leadership development programs designed to raise up positive role models among all the different kind of breakfast club uh, leadership groups in, in the schools, because the popular kids, they drive what cool looks like in those sure. schools. Unfortunately, right now, um, you know, shocking, funny, scary, you know, daring, that's what they think is cool. And we're losing kids, you know, as yeah. they're you know, they're just getting further and further away. So this message is kind of uh, it's edgy and it's cool because it's gangsters turned peacemakers. You know, they're trying to be role models. And what we've got to do is make, you know, this this positive life, this kind life, compassionate life, inclusive life, which is not what's happening in the schools. We got to make that cool. You know, so we got to put the bully out of business. If girls don't like the bully then guys aren't going to want to be bullies. As long as they do, you know, you know how that works. And so this is called protect the dream. And one of the biggest problems I see with this young generation, which is called Generation Z, who is brilliant, and be beautiful. They'll change the world if we can get their attention and just point them in the right direction and give them the tools and resources and support they need. They're going to change it all. But when I ask kids, hey, what's your dream? They look at me like, what does that even mean? You know right. what I'm saying? It's like, you mean, what did I dream last night? It's like, no, what's, what's the vision for your future that you have for yourself? And so we teach them how to dream. And then we break it into measurable goals. We set up healthy accountability. We have competition among students and among schools, and they get involved in service projects. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is help them to wrap a lot of value around their dream, whatever it is, get a diploma, you know, get a college education, get a scholarship, you know, go start a company, learn a trade, whatever. Um, we help them to focus on that because all they're hearing right now is don't drink that. Don't touch that. Don't smoke that. Don't go with her. Don't ride with him. Don't play that. Don't listen to that. Don't. It's like, don't, don't, don't. And it's become like Charlie Brown's teacher. Why, 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 why. They're not trying yeah. to hear it, right? Yeah. And so this is a program of, hey, here's what you could be, should be, you know, can do. And they're responding to it. And then, you know, lastly, kind of finish this thought is um, we, we get them to protect their dream from the dream killers. And so each week of this eight week process with stand up kids. And when I say stand out, I'm talking about knuckleheads as well as your, your good kid. Anybody that's leading, I don't care if you're leading. That's what we did in the prison. Give me your gang leaders. We can turn them. We get all their guys. And so, sure. you know, the gang leaders in the schools and the cheerleaders and the jocks and marching band, ROTC, performing arts, student government. We got to start with them. And sure. then we change their mind and they can, you know, get their hold. But the seven dream killers uh, promoting a bullying spirit irresponsible social media, unhealthy relationships, disrespect of authorities, objectifying classmates, drug and alcohol abuse, and lowering scholastic standards. Unfortunately, those are driven by the cool kids, and that is the shipwreck your dream formula is one or a combination of those dream killers. At the end, we celebrate and we, we reward them. And uh, we bring all of those rival teams together. We give awards. We give uh, two scholarships. Um, we reward those kids. So, you know, it's, it's catching on. 
It's a pretty amazing thing you got going here, man. It's a good thing. I love yeah. the message. I love what you bring. And, uh, you know, in a town that, that means as much to me as Muskegon does, and for as, as long of a one-sided story that we have had for, for so long here, you know, if, if, if a kid gets shot or a liquor store gets robbed or, or something like that, that's the front page news. And there right. is so much more here than, than what we're giving credit for and for, um, and I, you know, I think that holds true anywhere, um, you know, yeah. with sensationalized media and, and things like that, but we just seem to take the brunt of it here and it, it's, yeah. it's really, uh, not the case and it's not what uh, we should do in our, our, our talk of ourselves is, is what has to change first. And then that mm-hmm. message outward has to change as well. And if, if you're willing to come to town and, and, and be among those that uh, are, are the castaways, if you will, in the jail or the uh, the future leaders who are the, the, the best of the best and you can start to shape their mind in the way that they do things too, we'll be here to help promote your visits and uh, yeah. be a part of what you've got going on, man. So All thank right. you. Welcome so, in advance. I mean, we're a month out. You got anything you want to leave us with? Yeah, it's, it's so encouraging. Um, now, first it was prisons were calling, and then it was schools, and then it was churches, because we've got to have the church support. I mean, sure. just blanket the school for prayer. So we have 40-day projects for schools, prisons, and churches that all work in concert. And I call that the sometimes dysfunctional triangle of institutions that just aren't working right now. Schools are a pipeline to the prisons. Prisons are a repeat customer business. Churches, a lot of times, God bless them, are sitting on the sidelines, you know, not really pitching in. And sure. so we try to bring it together. But now cities are calling. So we're launching Selma, Alabama in two weeks. I mean, can you imagine this? I, I know Muskegon is a hot spot. And Benton Harbor, who you yeah. know about, I'm going to meet with the mayor there on October the 16th. Uh, to talk about this community initiative there because they had, you know, four unrelated shootings in one day a couple weeks mm. ago in their city of 10,000. Selma, <laughs> twice this month, has had fake 911 calls put in by the gangs. And when the cops show up, um, they're ambushed and the cars are shot up. Mm. That's happened not once, but twice. And so there's a tipping point in communities. And now people are kind of starting to find out about POP. They call us pop power of peace project. But, um, mm-hmm. and so I'm blown away just trying to follow in the footsteps of, of men like, you know, King and Gandhi and Mandela, just saying that I just strive to, to follow their message. And, uh, it gives me faith that any place can change if we can get the community to support it. Muskegon continues to invite me. And I believe that God is up to something and magic is going to happen. And it has nothing to do with certainly not me. It's you guys. Yeah. You know, that are going to be the catalyst. I just get to come and kind of start the fire and you guys fan it and let God do what he's going to do. Yeah. The ball's rolling and it, it's good to have somebody come along and, and, and be a part that uh, brings such a great message. We'll look yes. forward to seeing you here on October 14th, the New Life Christian Center, 10 o'clock at 1624 Hoyt Street, uh, Brooks Correctional Facility. Uh, if you're there, great. Enjoy the enjoy the talk. If not, don't go there. Um, and then uh, to Fruitport and then on uh, to Muskegon Middle School in the afternoon. And I know they'll be talking to you about some future dates as well as you get here uh, coming up in October. Great to meet you, man. Thanks for taking a couple of minutes today, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you here in person in uh, just a few weeks. Well, I appreciate what you're doing. Don't stop. You've got a great message, and uh, we need media support. Uh, we got to have a good story to start telling. Absolutely. And uh, so I'm behind you. Can't wait to meet you. Give you a big hug, man. All right, man. Kit, nice to talk to you today. Good luck, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks, man. All right, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you.